Well, uh, I'm excited again uh, to be back to be preaching. Um, over the next three weeks, uh, we'll be exploring various passages in Scripture, mostly from the book of Proverbs, on the topic of speech and how the uh, Bible describes wise versus foolish words, um, just versus wicked words, and loving versus hurtful words. And I guess I just want to be upfront and just share that um, of all the sermon series I've preached on so far at our church, this one has made me feel the most inadequate and the most hypocritical. Uh, I, don't know, I feel like as I, was, as I was planning out the sermon series and, uh, and even writing this one out, I, I was just so convicted by how much I complain, how much I hurt people with my words. Uh, it's just too much for my own liking. And um, I feel like I'm, also, I'm constantly confessing and repenting, oftentimes with your help, when you point out areas that I need to repent and grow. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a little weird for me to preach like here from like this. So I just want to be upfront and share that with you. I, as the, I was reading the book of James, and this really, I think James really reminds us of this, that indeed we all make many mistakes with our words, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. So again, I'm not standing here as someone who has it all figured out or um, who has an excellent control over my words, but as someone who has hurt people and someone who has also been hurt by people as well. And so not surprisingly then, um, after about a decade, almost a decade in ministry and having seen so many people get hurt and having been hurt, many times by people's words in the church. Personally, I think one of my greatest fears is that I will burn out from ministry because of people hurting me and my family with their words. So if you're feeling slightly uncomfortable with this series about words and speech, maybe because you wrestle with saying hurtful things or maybe you've been targeted, uh, um, you know, um, by slander and gossip, I just want to say like you're not alone in feeling uncomfortable. So today uh, we will be exploring the dichotomy of wise versus foolish words. And um, I had to narrow down a list of about 30 verses into like six. So obviously this will not be a full encompassing survey of what Proverbs says about this, but I did try and narrow down uh, to broader concepts, but also Areas where I think as a congregation that we can continue to work on. So how do we then recognize when we're being foolish with our words? How do we respond to foolish words? And how do we acquire wise words? So I have three points for today's message. They are first, the vicious cycle of foolish speech. Second, the right and wrong ways to respond to sin or foolishness. And third is the gospel of truth and grace. So the first point, the vicious cycle of foolish speech from Proverbs 18, 6 to 7. And I'll be reading mostly from the New Living Translation today. Fool's words get them into constant quarrels. They are asking for a beating. The mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. Christian author Paul Miller uh, writes in his book, A Praying Life, a self-righteousness is like bad breath. Everyone can smell it but you. Similarly, in one sense, I I think this verse implies that fools lack self-awareness. Fools have a habit of blaming others for the problems that they cause and find themselves in. For example, maybe you feel like nothing ever seems to go your way. No church community ever seems to live up to your standards. Or no pastor or ministry leader leader ever uh, seems to be good enough for you to follow. Or... Maybe no friend ever seems to care enough for you when you really need them. Maybe, this proverb is saying, the problem isn't everyone else. Maybe the problem is us. Maybe the problem is you. No one's getting up yet, so. (laughs) All right. And I think if we were to really play this out, what's incredibly sad is that people who struggle with this type of foolishness, oftentimes end up being incredibly lonely. They usually struggle making friends or have little to no friends because they have either pushed everyone away or people are afraid 
or people are afraid of being their friends. Usually, what it says in verse 6 is that they're quarrelsome. They have a critical spirit. And so being constantly around negative people can be exhausting for most of us, if not all of us. And so oftentimes, their own foolish words have led to their own ruin, and they don't even know it. They don't even have the self-awareness to know that it's actually their fault this whole time. You know, from elementary school to throughout high school, I wrestled a lot with abandonment issues because of my father's infidelity prior to his conversion to the Christianity. And without even knowing it, I went through a new best friend every couple of years. Not because these friends were bad people, but because I would cut them off when they got too close to me before they had a chance to abandon me. It was this weird, twisted pursuit of self-preservation. And I ended up pushing away a lot of good friends from early on in my life because of my fears and insecurities that they might hurt me if they get too close. Because in my mind, I had believed that if everyone that, I, that truly loves me will end up leaving me. Of course, by God's grace, that's been worked out, and I have some of my oldest friends now are still here with me, and I praise God for that. So there's hope for us. You know, if there's hope for me, there's hope for you all. And I, I and um, and I want to confess still and own up to this that during my youth, the fact that I lost a lot of good friends is not their fault; it's mine. I was the reason for my own ruin. What really sucks is that um, my best friend from middle school that I pushed away uh, eventually reached out to me after I got married, so like decades later. And um, I, I, I sort of kept up with him, but eventually he dropped off uh, like just um, social media and I didn't really know what happened. But I knew he dropped out of high school, that he got into drugs. Um, we, when we reconnected, he was on his way to recovery and um, just only after a few months of reconnecting, he prematurely died of a heart attack. And I often wonder how he would have turned out if I didn't cut him off when we were young. We both actually uh, grew up in the same youth group, but he, and as I was, as we were both kind of wrestling with our faith, I ended up sticking it out, he ended up leaving, and I wonder, would he have followed me to the church during that time? Would he have stayed away from drugs? Would he have eventually gotten married and have a kids of his own where our kids can also grow up to be friends? I'll never know. And I have, I have to live with that. The mouths of fools are their own ruin. However, in another sense, not everyone who appears to lack self-awareness isn't necessarily a fool. For example, awkwardness and neurodivergent behavior are not foolishness, right? The Bible doesn't have like a, a social normativity for which that we should all laugh at the same jokes or, 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 or behave a certain way. There's none of that. Humanity is too complex and God created us in this beautiful diversity of personalities and behaviors. There is no one right way to socialize. And so awkwardness, neurodivergence, is not foolishness here. It's not what he's getting at. Sometimes people know that they're socially different, but can't do anything about it. That's just who they are. They know they're pushing people away, but they don't know how not to. Many of us don't socialize in the manner consistent with social norms, and the result is that we are overlooked, gossiped about, or looked down upon. But if any community should be discerning enough to know the moral difference between being quarrelsome and awkward, because one is actually problematic morally, the other one is not, it should be the church. We as a church must learn to embrace those who are neurodivergent and not dismiss them for being 
quiet, different, awkward, unapproachable, or sounding rude or cold. Neurodivergence isn't categorically the same as being a fool that's described in Proverbs 18, 6 and 7. You know, as someone who is neurodivergent, I've experienced this type of judgment myself from uh, people in churches. I, I never hear it directly from them, but it's usually through the grapevine that so-and-so said X, Y, Z about me. And I've heard this about other neurodivergent people as well. So even kids, people judge kids who are neurodivergent. Oh, why are they so loud? Why do they just like always go around hitting people? Dude, stop judging. You don't know what's going on, right? And so I, I know for me personally, I've had to make multiple attempts to reconnect with people like that. And it's really challenging, right? And, and it's okay. And sometimes it's exhausting, but again, it's okay. And yet I can only imagine what other neurodivergent people in churches are going through. Right? When you don't have maybe the platform or the power that pastors who are neurodivergent may have, right? And so if you're neurodivergent and you're a follower of Christ, I want you to know that you're not alone. And there's no condemnation for you in Christ. Don't let folks who are judging you push you away or just don't like the way you joke or laugh at things or whatever it may be, that judgment does not define who you are. There is no condemnation for you in Christ. Second, the right and wrong way to respond. Proverbs 29, 11, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Now there are times when venting is legitimate. We learned about Psalms of Lament, where God's people are effectively venting at God about their suffering and their difficult life circumstances. And that's okay. In fact, it's encouraged to do this as, as it means that we're being honest with God about how we're struggling with our faith and, and ultimately we're crying out to help, asking him for strength to believe. Yet these Psalms are different from the foolish venting in Proverbs 29 11 in that the Psalms of lament are corporate, meaning they're collectively done together as a church family and they're prayerful. Sometimes you might do it alone when you're in the Word by yourself and lamenting to the Lord. Whereas the venting mentioned in Proverbs is rooted in bitterness, jealousy, or pride, or some, some, something similar to that. And they're usually done privately to an individual or clo close friends. Whereas venting in Psalms of Lament is, ask, is about asking God for more strength to believe, venting in Proverbs 29.11 is more about slander, gossip, and wanting to feel justified about our anger and bitterness or frustration towards someone or some group. The former is wise, whereas the latter is foolish. The former is more about crying out to the Lord, oftentimes with your faith family or privately in prayer, whereas the latter has the effect of harming someone's reputation, or causing destruction in someone's life. Again, one Christian writer put it this way, notice how you never gossip about the person you pray for. Again, notice that you never gossip about the person you pray for. If you're venting your frustrations about someone at God in prayer, you probably won't feel the need to air out your frustrations about that same person to your family or friends. You really want to know if someone is wise and spends time with the Lord in prayer? I'm not talking about raising up their hands during church service, but someone who really does this in the quiet and when no one's watching. Notice how they talk about their enemies, their leaders, or people you would expect them to be frustrated with. If it's in the manner of putting them down, I almost guarantee you they're not praying about they're not praying for them. And if they're not praying for them, what are they praying for? We're not praying for the people that are hurting us, our, en our quote, enemies. I mean, really, we're just going to the Lord as if he's Santa Claus, just asking for more nice things. If our prayer is so selfish, I mean, it's just incomplete, right? You know, Rachel and I have tried our best to call each other out and practice this uh, when we're about to vent about someone to each other. Uh, and if we sense that we're about to vent about someone out of frustration, we have often asked ourselves, um, or asked each other if um, we've prayed for that person first. 
And you know, sometimes it's frustrating because it's like, well, I'm just trying to be vulnerable. I'm just trying to get your help. If I can't talk to you, who can I talk to? You? Who can I talk to this about? Right? Right? We've all been there. But you know what? Try it. Go to the Lord in prayer first. Call your friends out when they're about to do this, and encourage them to go to the Lord first. Because it usually works. Either it stops us in our tracks and we end up not wanting to talk about that person anymore, or the way we were about to talk about the person is no longer like jaded or or just like riddled with like cynicism and criticism. It's it comes out totally differently. So instead of getting frustrated and venting at others about people who sin against us, how should we respond to that person instead? Other than in prayer. Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Again, it's very helpful here. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back into the, onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. I, I love the New Living Translation because it's just so in your face. You are not that important. <laughs> you know, I always tell people when I look for leaders to serve with, when I want to invite someone to train up to lead a certain ministry or depart, ministry department, whatever, I, I don't look for people who, have, who seem to have it all together anymore. There are just too many unknowns with people like that, and I've been burned too many times by people who I thought were solid and ended up being something else. Uh, so I don't want to make that mistake again. Rather, over time, I've, I, I, I ended up looking for uh, people who are quick to own up to their sins and repenting when they're called out. To me, that says far more about their maturity and potential as a leader than someone who appears friendly and is christian nice. You know, as your pastor, I can't guarantee I'll always be the best example of a gentle, kind, patient, or polished person. But what I can guarantee is that if you confront me about my sins, I will do my best to model quickness to repent where necessary. And I think this is what we should expect from our members. Not perfection, not polishedness, right? Not Christian niceness, but a quickness to confess and repent where necessary. Because oftentimes it's not fair or not accurate, right? But where necessary. Instead of foolishly uh, just venting our anger or bitterness about someone at other people, notice how Paul says to gently and humbly walk the person who offended us in repentance without committing the same sin they committed against us because we're not any better. I mean, what, 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 are, what, what situations can this be? It's usually like anger or slander. It's you find out someone was like really upset with you or someone was angry at you, you're tempted to what? Lash back. If, someone, if, you, if you heard that someone's talking trash about you, what, is, what are you tempted to do? Oh, I need to vent to my husband or my wife. <laughs> I need to get clarity from my best friend and talk about the evil that this person just committed against me because I'm not sure what to do. You know what Paul says that is? Hypocrisy, sin, it's slander. You are literally doing the same thing the person that you're upset uh, about the other person who did the same thing to you. It, it's, it's hypocrisy, Paul is saying. Be careful not to do the same thing and fall into the same temptation yourself. Our conf confrontation of someone who sinned against us ought not to be vindictive, but restorative, aimed at reconciliation. So the next time you see someone in sin, don't immediately tell me about it. Please, I don't want to hear any more about someone who upset you. Like, that's okay. Like, I want to be there and, and you know, be a, a, like a, a third party for that, yes, but let... I don't want to be the first person that you go to. Nor should I be, according to Scripture. The responsibility is on each and every one of us who were offended. We should talk to the person first. And if it doesn't go well, then Matthew 18 says, bring someone else with you. 
If someone in the church hurt you or misunderstood you, the wise thing to do is to gently and humbly resolve this issue, whereas the foolish thing to do is to vent about it or vent about our offenders to other people. This isn't to say we'll always agree with one another when we confront someone. Christian communities will not always agree on everything with everyone. If everyone agrees with everything uh, with everyone, um, and that's the you know, if you end up being in a church where every everyone just agrees with everything on every uh, with agrees on everything with everyone, that's not a church. You know what that's called? A cult. Thank you. <laughs> However, among Christians, we're called to live at peace uh, at peace with one another. Even as we disagree or get hurt in the process because none of us are any better than the person next to us. That is wisdom. Third and final point, the gospel of truth and grace. Proverbs 12, 12 verse 1. The words of the reckless pierce like words, but the tongue of the wise bring healing. I'm sorry, that's 12, 18. Uh, and 12, uh, verse 1 says, to learn, you must love discipline. It is stupid to hate correction. I love the NLT. <laughs> Proverbs 12, 18, again, isn't saying that words that heal while hurting our pride are foolish, okay? I want to be clear here that, oh man, I know what you said is true, but that still hurt my feelings. No, that's not what it's saying, okay? Like, words that heal <clears throat> might sometimes hurt, but it's, it's not this reckless piercing with swords type of hurt. Sometimes healing words can hurt, but that, that kind of hurt is different and it's actually good for us. What I mean is that if we are humble, healing words sometimes might sting, but only because they hurt our pride and insecurities. Okay? That momentary pain, it's called conviction. <laughs> and it's meant to lead us to repentance. But if all we want is flattery and be told positive affirmation, that's not wise, nor does that bring lasting healing, according to verse uh, chapter 12, verse 18. I think about it before, you know, I, um, some of you know, I hate yard work, um, but it's just something we have to do. Um, and we, um, I, you know, every, if you, if you ever have to take care of your own lawn, you know that in the fall, you have to aerate your lawn, you have to replant the seeds. Well, I forgot to do that last fall. So I had to do that this spring and it was all kind of too late. And so there were all these weeds that grew in and all these dry patches of dead grass. And so I had to spend countless hours, um, you know, trying to fix my lawn, and I don't think it did anything. But in that process, to heal my lawn, to plant new seeds of grass, I have to first what remove seed the uh, remove the the weeds by the roots first to clear the way for the seeds to grow. Likewise, sometimes for healing, uh, uh, healing from wise words. Um, so for sometimes for healing to occur in our hearts, sometimes we need to go through the painful process of uprooting weeds first through the words of the wise. And oftentimes then, pain precedes healing. On the other hand, when reckless words pierce like swords, it means that these, their words are, are harsh. They lack grace, probably not even accurate. Or maybe partial, like, like half accurate, right? Truth and grace then must go hand in hand. If all we do is speak the truth, then we're reckless and it cuts those around us unnecessarily. This is uh, oftentimes why people leave the Christian faith because our words, though they may be true and biblical, are, in, are, are, um, are not infused with grace. And so they associate harshness and almost bullying with God's word. But at the, on the flip side, if all we do is speak grace, that's also reckless. And it cuts those around us because our words never address the sins of our community members. Our words lack prophetic power in our communities, in our society, and our words enable evildoers. In the end, showing grace without truth also cuts those around us just as painfully in the long run. So what is the balance? I mean, I think the first and foremost, I think we, we get a better picture of this from the gospel. The message of the gospel has no power apart from 
Well, let me say this again. The, the, the positive message that you're forgiven, loved, and accepted, and adopted has no power apart from the knowledge and proclamation of sin. For example, if I went to the doctor because I had stomach pain and the doctor told me after my exam, you know, just take this medication three times a day for two weeks and you'll be fine. And if a doctor were just so flippant about my prescription without even telling me the full diagnosis, I mean, let's be real. Do you think I'll take the medication three times a day for two whole weeks? Probably not. Some of you are doctors and and, and don't take this personally, but you know how bad your patients are about taking prescription medication according to the schedule that you give us. Probably why antibiotics are losing their effectiveness, right? (laughs) And you know, over time what happens? We forget, oh, we only end up taking once a day. Or we forget, like, skip a whole day. And two weeks turns into four weeks. And sometimes, like five days into it, our symptoms are all gone, so we think we're all better, so we stop taking it, only to have the symptoms return a week later, and we're back to square one, and the medication we used first doesn't work anymore. All right? Big mess, right? Well, let's say that instead of the doctor just telling me to take my meds, what if he told me, after my exam, Moses, I'm so sorry to say this, but you have stomach cancer, and you only have six months to live. But it just so happens that the FDA just approved this miracle cancer treatment drug that you can take at home three times a week, three times a day for two weeks and you'll be all better. And I have it right here in my hand if you want it. How do you think I'll respond? I mean, at first, maybe to the news that I only have six months to live, I'd probably feel incredibly sad and suffer emotionally over this newfound truth about my health. But as soon as the doctor takes out the medication, I'll probably snatch it out of his hand and take the first dose immediately on the spot and then run to the pharmacy to get more and diligently take it at home, put my alarms on my calendar to make sure I don't forget so that I can get healed. The gospel then has, is very similar in that the good news makes no sense without the bad news. The wisdom of the gospel um, is mute, lacks power when you don't have both. So whether it be our our salvation or our sanctification, the gospel requires, believing the gospel requires the painful knowledge of our sins and shortcomings in order for us to truly appreciate more deeply our healing and forgiveness in Christ so that we can become more wise and obedient to God's word. The good news makes no sense without the bad news. Sometimes we need, for us to be healed, we need to feel some pain first. Confrontation then about our sin humbles us to obedience only if we know we have hope to become more like Christ in the Holy Spirit. So again, that's the good news. But confrontation about our sin crushes us if it was up to us to improve ourselves. So bad news without good news is also crushing. Truth, when it's meant, when meant for good, might initially hurt, but when grace accompanies truth, it brings about our healing and greater wisdom. And I want to clarify for those of us who are, who are neurodivergent, It often takes being misunderstood to sympathize with those who are often misunderstood in our midst. Is that not true? Sometimes you have to go through it yourself and you have to live with it yourself for us to truly understand those who are going through something similar. I think the encouraging part about this is that Even our Savior, who was perfect, who did nothing wrong, was still misunderstood by his enemies, by his own family, and he was murdered for it. If anyone understands the cost of feeling misunderstood, it's Jesus. If Jesus could be misunderstood, we shouldn't be surprised when we are too, as we try to obey and follow Christ. But being misunderstood, then, has a, has a silver lining, has a, God redeems that because it can often be a catalyst for sympathy for others in similar situations. And yet, we are not perfect. So being misunderstood more often than not requires still a growth in wisdom 
and repentance on our part. Just because we're always misunderstood doesn't mean we can just play the victim all the time. Okay? It's not that everyone must accommodate for us then. No, it's a, it goes both ways. We might be victims. Uh, being misunderstood me, uh, doesn't mean that we are just only victims um, and that our slander, slanderers are 100% um, perpetrators. We might be vi victims of slander at times, but we are not innocent, nor perfect, or as Paul would say, nor any better. This means then we should not weaponize our traumas, our mental health issues, or our neurodivergences to justify, and I say this as someone who wrestles with this, to justify our rudeness, our lack of empathy, or our inability to understand people, or our recklessness with our speech. We can't just play the neurodivergence card and say, sorry, you have to accept me for who I am. I might be saying a lot of offensive things, but it's because I'm neurodivergent. You can't judge me. We can't play that card. All of us still need to grow in wisdom. All of us still need to acknowledge that even though we are neurodivergent, we still hurt people. And we still need to own up to it and continue to pursue the Lord. And at the same time, the covenant community that Christ is building through his kingdom is an inclusive one. Of all the communities out there, should not the church be the most patient, forgiving, understanding, and sympathetic to those who are different? For those who do not fit the social norms. I mean, I think it's sad that in this day and age when not, uh, that non-Christians make greater efforts to love their neighbors with mental health issues, with, with special needs, traumas, and, and neurodivergences that, um, than the church does. It's a sign that the church has lost its way. We are not where we should be. We need to look to Christ who was crucified for being misunderstood and repent of the ways that we too have been crucified, that we too have crucified our brothers and sisters who are frequently misunderstood by us talking poorly about them, by dismissing them, or not speaking up for them when others, are, when others ridicule them unfairly. When was the last time where we spoke up for people who were ridiculed in our midst? Oftentimes, we just want to be a good friend as a friend's vent and listen. And guess what? Scripture would say that's sin. We need to first encourage our brothers and sisters to go to the Lord when that happens. We need to stop them from ridiculing other believers, especially when we suspect them of having different struggles in their lives. As we transition to communion, my hope is that all of us have in some way felt convicted by today's message about our need to grow in wisdom and or repent of foolishness. Again, as the book of James reminds us, the tongue is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. With the same mouth that we praise God, we curse those who are made in the image of God. I'll add to this, with the same mouth that we curse those who are made in the image of God, we receive communion with. We're so hypocritical. This is a great contradiction, a, a war of ideology of sorts. In Christ, however, communion reminds us that Christ is already victorious over our foolishness, that he has forgiven us for our hurtful words, that he is healing us in our midst, and that the elements of communion are a spiritual strength to those who need the Spirit's help to grow in wisdom and to heal from the times that we have been hurt by other people. So wherever you fall, um, the real spiritual blessings are co of communion are for you. May our hearts be uplifted and our souls be empowered to continue to pursue Christ and his wisdom with our words. Now, at this time, the ushers will dismiss you by row. Please walk through the middle and take the elements of communion back to your seats uh, through the sides if you're a professing baptized believer. And we and we will partake in these elements together as a church family. If you have not yet declared faith and have not been baptized, or you're just a visitor unsure about your faith, we're so glad you're here. And even as you participate uh, with us through observing the believers here take communion, we, we, we invite you to walk up with everyone. Uh, but we just ask you to refrain from taking these elements of communion.
Instead, can we ask you to invite you to really uh, reflect on what we shared today? Because the same mercies that he extends to his children, he offers you as well. continue to be led through this world of sorrow into life, life eternal. 